I was extremely pleased to uh, be invited, and I'm deeply honored. And I was also extremely happy that uh, the first keynote speech uh, was by uh, my good friend uh, Martin Revelian. And I must say that uh, after hearing uh, Martin, um, I uh, uh, remembered when I first started teaching development economics, this was decades ago, and I would start with uh, Weber and Marx, uh, and then I would finish essentially with uh, Herod Doma. And I would always say uh, it's going from the sublime to the ridiculous. And in some respects, I'm afraid that uh, uh, I, some of the things I'm going to say, because I'm going to look at the uh, anatomy of growth and uh, institutional uh, structure in a very nitty gritty way. Uh, so uh, I hope that uh, uh, what I have to say is not going to sound uh, too uh, ridiculous. So um, let me get uh, uh, started. And uh, uh, again, uh, a quick uh, digression. Uh, this morning, as I was walking over, I thought about the uh, serendipity of creativity and that a person of my age simply cannot be creative. I mean, they say that uh, mathematicians reach the, uh, the age beyond which they cannot be creative. It's about 22. For physicists, it's 25. Uh, for most of the population, it may be 10. There's nothing more creative than the mind of a young child. And lately, I've completed reading a book on physics by uh, uh, Letterman, and uh, one of the examples that he gives is uh, Alan uh, Guth's uh, theory of expansion of the universe. Uh, Guth was a uh, young particle physicist who knew nothing about cosmology, and he was working on a very different uh, problem. And uh, suddenly he realized that he had all of the pieces together to explain something that until then had not been explained, namely, how come the universe was constantly uh, uh, expanding. And in a very modest way, he said, uh, really, my, my contribution uh, was ready uh, uh, to be uh, uh, achieved. I just put all of these pieces uh, together, nothing to be very proud of. And uh, Wolfgang uh, Pauli, who was one of the... Uh, Wunderkinder of physicists uh, uh, in his time, uh, when he heard about it, uh, said, Ah, I know too much to be creative. Well, this sounds arrogant, but uh, there is some truth to it. Over time, you accumulate a baggage, and it's, it's difficult to see with uh, entirely new uh, uh, eyes. But I will try to make some contributions. I think there are a few things that I have to say which uh, uh, you might be consider, considering, uh, 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 if not creative, uh, 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 a new way of looking at things. So uh, let me very briefly go over the content of uh, my presentation. Uh, the first thing I want to do is to say something about inclusive growth in uh, sub-Saharan Africa and perhaps how uh, it could differ from uh, other developing countries. Then I will go into a, uh, a tale of uh, two uh, worlds, uh, two very, very different ways of looking not only at the degree of inclusiveness in growth, but also of the kind of strategy that is called for uh, to address uh, inclusive growth. Then I will go into structural transformation and the kind of structural transformation that is needed to generate uh, growth. Then um, one of the topics that I have been working on for the last 10 years, and some of you uh, have heard me talk about it already, I'll say something about the interrelationships li linking growth, inequality, and poverty and two different strategies, the pro-poor growth as well as the pro-growth poverty reduction. Uh, then I'll say something about what uh, Martin was uh, mentioning yesterday. Um, how is it or why is it or is it really so that uh, 
a high initial poverty can dampen growth, can be a break on growth, and is this really true within the context of uh, Africa? Then the second part of my presentation, and again, because of uh, uh, time constraints, I'm, I'm afraid I won't be able to say too much here, is on the uh, architecture of institutions conducive to inclusive growth. Um, in a different paper that I did uh, for JICA, I looked at uh, uh, institutions uh, that uh, could be conducive to, to uh, uh, greater uh, growth. So again, depending on time, uh, I will say something about it. So before it is too late, and I've been caught short many times uh, uh, over a long lifetime, let me give you the, uh, the main messages. First of all, what I will do is uh, emphasize the reverse causality from poverty reduction to growth, which I think is a very important uh, uh, link. Um, I will uh, claim, um, and, and it's a tentative claim, I think much more research is needed, that the uh, recent structural transformation in many of the African countries is more inclusive than it has been in the past. And I'm going to raise the question as to whether there is something different in the anatomy of growth in uh, sub-Saharan Africa compared to other developing countries. Uh, at one time, uh, Eastland and Levin were talking about the African dummy. So in a way, uh, it's an attempt at, if not uh, uh, elucidating uh, this uh, dummy, uh, trying to understand it uh, better. Um, one of the points that I'm going to make, and, and I hope uh, Martin is here because uh, it bears directly on his work, uh, it is not clear that high initial poverty retards subsequent growth in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. Um, I've done some additional work using his own data set, and it shows that uh, the uh, uh, results for the uh, African subsample tend to be different than for the, the whole uh, uh, sample. Uh, then um, my recommendation is going to be to follow a, a strategy of pro-growth poverty reduction in the selection of uh, inclusive uh, institutions. And again, I will claim that such institutions uh, exist and uh, can be designed to conform to the conditions which exist in uh, uh, Africa. So very quickly, uh, what are the, the features of uh, uh, inclusive growth within the context of uh, Africa, which uh, perhaps are somewhat different than uh, within the context of uh, other developing countries? Um, the, uh, uh, in the case of uh, Asia, and I just completed a paper for the uh, Asian Development Bank on uh, inclusive growth, um, it is not clear that uh, growth has led to uh, greater inequality. It has led to greater inequality in some countries, particularly in China, but overall, uh, there is, one cannot necessarily generalize. In a number of countries, uh, inequality has not uh, increased. Uh, so in the case of uh, um, Asia, and perhaps less so Latin America, uh, to adopt the uh, um, relative definition of uh, uh, pro-poor growth does uh, 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 make a little bit less sense than within the case of Africa. But I think within the case of Africa, it's quite clear that uh, um, it is important to have a reduction in inequality as uh, an objective. A second, I think, uh, difference, and again, it's maybe a minor difference, is that the uh, inequality of opportunities is probably greater uh, in uh, Africa, and it means that in terms of uh, uh, benefits um, uh, derived by the, the poor and the near poor, 
uh, in terms of education, in terms of health, um, are really significantly less than the benefits derived uh, by uh, uh, individuals and households uh, in the uh, uh, higher uh, uh, income uh, brackets. So if one really wants to, if one really wants to uh, change the income distribution uh, and facilitate a structural transformation and, and it event eventually lead it to a social transformation where the poor have greater voice, I think it's extremely important to emphasize social protection schemes that provide uh, more education, better health to the, uh, to the poor. And then employment, employment, employment is absolutely crucial within the uh, uh, context of uh, Africa. So now the tale of uh, two uh, worlds, and uh, uh, I think, and this is a caricature, and take it as a caricature, uh, there are two economic camps, I think, um, and you can distinguish these camps according to two different distinctions. The first distinction is uh, that everybody uh, agrees that growth is a necessary condition, is essential uh, for uh, development to take place. But some uh, economists feel that uh, a proactive government is crucial. Uh, others feel that uh, we ought to have a minimalist government, leave it very much to uh, uh, free enterprise. And in this connection, the New York Times recently had a wonderful article where they uh, uh, confronted Amartya Sen's view with uh, that of Bhagwati. And Sen was quoted as saying, this Indian administration thinks that the only thing that works is business. That's a disastrous position to uh, take. Bhagwati, on the other hand, said, Sen's position is mistaken and dangerous since money spent on government programs is largely wasted. India's myriad problems have less to do with poor health and literacy than a poor investment climate. So again, um, for the sake of simplification, let's call sense position growth with government and uh, Bhagwati uh, growth is enough, GG and GE. The second distinction has to do with uh, how the, the perception by different economists how of how inclusive the present uh, growth spell is in uh, uh, sub-Saharan Africa. And here the uh, glass is seen as half full, and again it's a caricature, uh, by people like uh, Solai Martin, uh, Young, IMF. Um, on the other hand, it's seen as half empty by uh, certainly uh, AERC, a large number of publications, the uh, project on uh, the interaction between uh, growth and poverty, and many other collaborative projects, FOSU, the uh, African Development Bank, uh, and uh, uh, I could count myself uh, in this uh, camp. So there is, I think, a large overlap <clears throat> between the uh, uh, half empty and uh, uh, government, proactive government uh, role, uh, and between the uh, half full and growth is enough uh, promote, uh, proponents. However, and I found this very surprising, I went back to some of the uh, recent uh, <coughs> IMF document, uh, there appears to be much more convergence between the HEGG uh, world and the HFGE world in the context of Africa than other developing regions. Even the uh, IMF recognizes a, uh, an important role uh, for, the, uh, for the government and the need for uh, social protection and uh, uh, labor schemes. And this, I think, is, is, uh, uh, is somewhat encouraging. Okay, quickly, some uh, uh, facts to judge uh, the uh, uh, degree of uh, uh, inclusiveness uh, in uh, Africa. Uh, first, since 19 to 2000, remarkable growth, something like 3% per capita GDP per annum. 
compared to 0% between 1960 and 2000. Headcount poverty went down from 58% to 48% between 96 and 2010. Uh, Ravi Kambu at one time uh, made the, uh, uh, I think, the very incisive comment that uh, really one shouldn't just look at the uh, headcount ratio, one should look at the number of poor. There the situation is not quite as good. There has been an increase in the absolute number of uh, uh, poor. Uh, income inequality is still very high. Um, only 28% of the labor force has uh, stable uh, jobs. 63% uh, have uh, vulnerable jobs. The, the McKinsey report that I would recommend uh, has uh, changed the definition. We used to talk in terms of formal as opposed to informal employment. They talk in terms of stable versus uh, uh, vulnerable uh, jobs. And then uh, uh, I think it's fair to say that the, the distribution of uh, social benefits uh, tends to be very uneven in uh, Africa. So let me now move to the, what I call the anatomy of growth and particularly uh, the, the structural transformation. Um, the World Development uh, Report uh, of 2008, which was on uh, agriculture and development, made the point that uh, until the early 2000s uh, in uh, sub-Saharan Africa, workers tended to be pushed out of agriculture rather than pulled into uh, other sectors, uh, into more productive uh, sectors. And this you could characterize as a migration of, mi of misery. These people essentially by being pushed out were forced into unproductive uh, jobs in the uh, uh, informal uh, sector. And they contrasted this with a very successful uh, structural transformation uh, in most of the uh, Asian countries. Now, um, the, I don't know how much of this you can see, but the, the point here is that the uh, a flawed, um, taking the wrong one now, uh, a, uh, a flawed structural transformation would lead to a, a vertical uh, time arrow. What it would mean is that the share of the labor force in agriculture declines with no growth in income. On the horizontal axis, you have uh, the, the log of per capita income. So for many African countries until the early 2000s, the structural transformation was flawed. In the case of most of the Asian countries, you see that it's followed the more normal uh, pattern. So wh what I did, um, I was curious to see, well, here is again the same uh, 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 graph uh, the, for uh, uh, Africa, and you see in many countries uh, this almost vertical line. So um, wh what I did, I'm getting, um, <clears throat> I updated the uh, WDR 2008 data set, and it's very difficult to find uh, data uh, on uh, labor shares uh, for more than two, sometimes three periods. But I was able to find uh, 14 countries, and the uh, structural transformation appears much more normal for most of these countries. The only really outlier was uh, uh, Mali. There were a few countries, Botswana, Ghana, uh, Liberia, that reveals uh, a rising share of agricultural employment together with growth. And the only possible explanation is that uh, maybe because of the changing composition of agricultural output, uh, agricultural workers were doing better in, these, uh, in the production of these uh, new uh, products. So this is, uh, uh, this is what we were able to, uh, to do. And uh, uh, you can see, it may not be obvious, but you can see that the, uh, 
structural transformation over the, uh, the last decade, or I should say between 2000 and 2011, uh, tends to be uh, following much more the normal pattern than uh, uh, it did in the, uh, uh, in the past. So tentative conclusion, uh, the uh, uh, structural transformation uh, appears to be relatively more uh, inclusive. What does it reflect? I would say it reflects a more orderly and productive uh, migration process. The uh, uh, policy environment has changed. Uh, the uh, exploitation of agriculture is less now than it used to be, yet much more uh, needs to be done. So let me now move to uh, the uh, uh, interrelationship among growth inequality and uh, uh, poverty. And here, basically, two forces are uh, influencing this interrelationship. The first force is globalization. And that's essentially exogenous from the standpoint of a given country. There's very little they can do about it. Uh, and the other is the development strategy that is followed by a country, which at least partially is uh, uh, endogenous. So the, uh, uh, these two forces, globalization, the development strategy that is adopted, uh, will affect this uh, uh, nexus. And uh, each of the uh, links, first the link from uh, uh, openness to growth, the link from uh, openness to uh, distribution, the link from uh, uh, growth to distribution, which is the old uh, Kuznets curve, uh, the uh, link from uh, inequality to uh, growth, as well as the link from growth to poverty and the link from distribution to inequality, uh, will have to be looked at very uh, uh, carefully to understand this, uh, the dynamics of, uh, uh, of uh, growth. So um, very, very quickly, let me go into some of these uh, links. Um, if you take the, uh, the, the, blue, uh, the light uh, blue arrow, uh, it's very clear that uh, uh, a, a country like Kenya relying on... Uh, uh, export of uh, horticultural uh, products, that the impact of this growth will be very different than uh, oil exports from Nigeria. In one case, it's a labor-intensive product. In the other case, it's almost a completely capital-intensive product. Uh, the pace of growth may be very high in Nigeria, but the pattern of growth is hardly likely to be inclusive and uh, vice versa. Um, the uh, link, the green arrow, uh, linking the development stra strategy and globalization to uh, distribution, uh, here, um, looking at, at a whole sample of African countries, I found as many countries in which uh, inequality had increased uh, over the last 10 years as countries in which it had uh, gone down. But again, if you, if you want to come up with a composite index and you weigh it according to population, then you can say that the Gini coefficient has gone up. Not very much. I think it went up from something like 44.44 to something like uh, 0.47. Uh, the, uh, uh, the Kuznets curve has been uh, largely dethroned uh, for the simple reason that uh, uh, there is no uh, iron law that uh, necessarily uh, leads to uh, a, uh, an increase in inequality at an early stage of development followed by a reduction. It depends at least partially on the policies that are followed by the, uh, by the countries. And then, of course, the, the other two, from growth to poverty, from uh, distribution to poverty, you can say that income distribution acts as a filter on the uh, impact of growth on poverty. Now, later on, what I will do is emphasize very strongly the reverse causality starting from uh, poverty. But this will come in just a, a few minutes. Um, 
So, uh, in terms of the impact of uh, inequality on growth, there are two conflicting theories. The old uh, neoclassical Caldor uh, theory uh, claimed that uh, since uh, the marginal propensity to uh, save of the rich was higher than that of the poor, uh, a, an unequal income distribution was almost a precondition for economic growth. The new political economy of development, people like Roderick, uh, uh, claim on the contrary that uh, uh, greater inequality leads to uh, social conflict, political conflicts, and can dampen uh, growth. So again, depending on which one of these two uh, uh, theories you uh, believe in, uh, you're going to uh, have very different uh, policy prescriptions. Uh, I am uh, I rather strongly uh, in favor of the, uh, the new political economy of development uh, uh, story. Okay, um, the, uh, now uh, we come to the reverse causality from uh, poverty to growth. And uh, Martin, in a, uh, I think, a very important article uh, in the AER, finds that high initial poverty rates have sizable negative impacts on the growth rate. Um, and the, uh, what we already knew, the growth elasticity of poverty reduction tends to be lower in countries with uh, a higher initial level of uh, poverty. So if, if uh, I mean, in a way, you can have two different strategies. I mean, they, they're very much overlapping if you want to. But one strategy, which is the, the well-known pro-poor growth strategy, grows from growth to lower inequality to poverty reduction. But the other one is poverty reduction will lower inequality. And by lowering inequality, and also for other reasons that are not entirely clear, is going to contribute to uh, growth. And I, uh, in my message, I would strongly uh, uh, favor uh, looking at the feasibility of uh, this uh, uh, strategy. OK, um, yesterday, uh, Martin talked, this was at a, probably a meeting where not all of you were, about poverty traps. Well, we know that there are many, many poverty uh, traps. And I list some of them uh, here. I don't want to go into them. And then the question is, can some of these poverty traps uh, be uh, changed? Uh, these are vicious circles. Can, be, can they be converted? Uh, in uh, virtuous uh, circles. So what I would uh, propose here is a, a development strategy that by um, having institutions and having policies that reduce poverty directly can also lead to greater productivity by changing very often the behavior of the poor. Think of uh, um, a, uh, a social protection scheme um, a, la, um, a la Progressa, a la Oportunidades, a la Bolsa Familia in Brazil, uh, or in the case of, of Africa, the uh, uh, Ethiopian uh, uh, Public Works uh, Program. By reducing poverty, uh, it uh, frees uh, the uh, uh, recipients from uh, uh, being unable to take certain risks. There's plenty of evidence that with uh, the money that they get or that they save by uh, uh, essentially having not to pay for fees for their children, uh, free lunches and so on, they can start businesses and it can be productive. So uh, you could, in a way, think of uh, the intervention reducing poverty as being productive and leading to uh, a, a virtuous uh, a spiral. OK, the, 
some of you may say, well, what's the difference between uh, pro-growth poverty reduction and uh, pro-poor growth strategy? And I think the, the main difference is that the, uh, the trigger point uh, in, in the former is uh, directly on poverty, reducing poverty directly, uh, which it isn't in the, uh, in the second case. Now, um, coming back to uh, Martin, um, his point that high initial poverty rates have sizable negative impacts on growth, um, I confronted it with uh, some uh, uh, evidence. Uh, well, the first point I think that I should make here is that when you first encounter this statement, you say, well, of course, uh, the, uh, the countries that have uh, high poverty will have uh, low growth. But his point is a much more subtle one. He checks for the endogeneity, and he claims that uh, uh, there is a causal relationship between high initial poverty and subsequent growth. Now, um, I confronted the, um, uh, this hypothesis with micro evidence from uh, 15 Ethiopian vi villages uh, and uh, something like uh, 30 Rwanda district. And what I found was exactly the opposite, that uh, uh, in both cases, high initial poverty led to uh, high growth. So um, let me first give you the evidence. Um, this is a case of uh, Ethiopian uh, villages. Uh, on the vertical axis, you have uh, average per capita consumption growth. You see that uh, countries with uh, uh, high uh, initial incidence of poverty have uh, higher growth. In the case of, uh, um, again, Ethiopian villages, uh, and looking now at the average rate of uh, growth in poverty reduction, uh, poverty, the average rate of growth of poverty reduction was higher in the uh, uh, villages where the uh, uh, initial poverty was high. Same thing for the uh, uh, Rwandan uh, districts. So how, how, does we, how can we resolve this paradox? Well, one way of uh, resolving this paradox is to uh, hypothesize that uh, the Ethiopian and Rwandan governments allocated anti-poverty and social protection funds proportionately to the incidence of poverty. And I checked with uh, Shimeles, who uh, arguably is one of the most knowledgeable uh, Ethiopian uh, uh, economists, and he said this, it, this clearly, or there clearly was and still is, a conscious effort uh, in, uh, in that direction. So then um, my uh, curiosity uh, uh, led me to uh, uh, try to redo, uh, retest the uh, Revelian equations using the African subsample. Uh, Martin's uh, uh, sample consists of something like 97 countries, the African subsample uh, 32. So we esti estimated the regressions, and surprisingly, the results suggest no statistically significant correlation between initial consumption expenditure and per capita consumption growth. But lo and behold, significant and positive correlation between initial poverty and consumption growth. And uh, uh, here you have a, uh, a diagram that uh, shows this. Again, on the horizontal axis, you have uh, the uh, uh, initial uh, log uh, headcount ratio. And on the vertical one, you have the annual per capita consumption growth. And this was true for those countries that had uh, uh, two growth spells, as well as for those countries that had uh, three uh, growth uh, spells. Uh, what, uh, and, and this is highly speculative, what would be a speculative explanation? One could be that the poorest African countries in the past underwent the greatest improvements in governance and vice versa. Cote d'Ivoire would be an example 
uh, or vice versa, suffered more from ethnic and other conflicts and shocks that were at least partially resolved. Um, and, and again, it, it raises the issue of the African dummy. And, and I, I raise this as a big question mark at, and as an area that uh, really ought to be uh, uh, researched uh, further. So now, and, and do I have about five minutes? Uh, five, five minutes. So very, very briefly, um, uh, the institutional architecture for uh, inclusive growth, and, uh, in, in I think a, 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 an extremely incisive book uh, that I recommend to you uh, uh, by Asimoglu and Robinson, uh, Why Nations Fail, one of the main conclusions is uh, that growth and development can only be sustained if anchored on inclusive political and economic institutions. And then they essentially say that the tragedy of Africa is that highly extractive colonial institutions create an opening for unscrupulous leaders after independence. And I think it's, it's not unfair to say that uh, uh, in many African countries there is a, a vacuum of national inclusive institutions. Now, uh, the, the, I think the, the, perhaps the main reason for this is that in, in the case of many African countries, the, the loyalty of an individual is not to the state, it's not to the nation, but it is to the clan or the uh, ethnic group. So to come up with national uh, inclusive uh, uh, institutions is, 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 a, is a very difficult process because it means uh, working out all of the necessary compromises and uh, different uh, values and objectives of uh, uh, different uh, groups. Now, uh, there is, again, this is a claim on my part, uh, there is strong and convinc convincing evidence that social protection and labor schemes exist that are both poverty reducing and productive. So that means that there is no necessary trade-off between equity and efficiency. Uh, in the old days, uh, um, it was taken for granted that uh, any uh, attempt at reducing poverty uh, would have an opportunity cost in terms of uh, uh, efficiency. So appropriate poverty reduction institutions could lead to uh, uh, higher growth. Now, I, I try to uh, think of the, the, the major pillars of the architecture of inclusive uh, institutions, and it seems to me that there are, in the case of uh, Africa, there are four of them, uh, greater centralization. Um, secondly, they have to be broad-based. Uh, given the large number of poverty traps that exist, you cannot really operate on each of these poverty traps independently. You really need a broad-based uh, strategies. The schemes already have to be there. You cannot wait until <clears throat> a shock. It's too late. I mean, Indonesia paid a very high price in 97 by not having in place such uh, uh, safety nets. Uh, and again, uh, it's very obvious that there is no one-size-fits-all. Um, the uh, uh, specificity, uh, the context specificity is, is very high, so they have to be tailored to the, the culture, um, institutional capability, governance of a, uh, of a given uh, country. So uh, what I did, and I, I probably won't have time to, to really go into it, but I um, tried to come up with uh, not only features, but also issues and recommendations for specific institutions within uh, three uh, areas, very interrelated, small-scale agriculture, infrastructure, and uh, uh, social protection schemes. Uh, um, I will say that uh, Africa can learn a great deal from the uh, experience in uh, uh, East uh, Africa. Uh, one of the uh, issues uh, is that since so many of these countries are small, 
uh, you need supranational institutions um, in terms of infrastructure as well as in terms of uh, research, which, which means greater regional uh, uh, integration. Um, the uh, present structural uh, transformation is inclusive, but it needs much more uh, in order to create a social transformation. And, and this brought up a, a thought that I had. I know the transformation, uh, transformation is uh, uh, a key concept in the uh, new program of uh, research of WIDER. And I think one area that you could look at is how structural transformation by uh, changing the uh, uh, income distribution uh, and also by providing the poor greater benefits in terms of education, health, and so on, how this can lead to greater voice for the poor, greater representation, uh, and ultimately social transformation. So the key here is how do you go from structural transformation to uh, social uh, transformation. So I, uh, I get the message. Uh, let me uh, conclude. Uh, what are the concluding messages? Structural transformation uh, in the present growth spell is more normal than it used to be, which is good news. The relationship between initial poverty incidence and subsequent growth needs to be clarified in Africa. Uh, the uh, new pattern of growth, even though more inclusive than uh, in the last millennium requires major institutional changes. Um, I believe that a, a pro-growth poverty reduction strategy is both appropriate and feasible. There's a strong case for the productive role of social protec protection and uh, labor scheme. And uh, uh, the, the present uh, growth spell in Africa, what people call the uh, African Renaissance, uh, is probably the right time to do something. It's a lot easier to uh, uh, come up with institutional changes during a period of growth than it is during a period of stagnation. So thank you very much, Mr. Chairman.